Okay. And um, we've had a lot of questions, <clears throat> excuse me, questions coming in from patients who want to travel, but are also wanting to do it safely. And I'd like to share these questions to everyone to come on and comment on, in fact, and also be sharing some of my ideas. And then specifically, we'll have some questions for Dr. Byram also. So let's start with um, the first set of questions. Um, I'm going to do the patient, the questions about travel first, if that's okay with you both. Um, and I'll start with you, Victor. Have you had any experience while traveling that was related to your vascularized symptoms and how did you handle it? I've been very fortunate that I've not had any vasculitis flares or issues while traveling, um, but it's still the same token. I'm prepared if it were, were to happen with medications and equipment if necessary. The be prepared thing. Um, I also have not had any problems with my vasculitis while traveling. I've done a lot of traveling in the last 10 years or so, um, but I haven't had a flare. I have had some illnesses and some things that happened um, on one really, really long flight, but I don't think it's any different from another person. Um, and, and I had a traveling companion, my husband, who was great at assisting me. Um, I was just going to ask you that. In fact, um, how does your travel companion, I presume your wife most of the time, help you or assist you or make you feel that you're comfortable in case of an emergency? Well, the good news is, is she is just as familiar with my trach as I am, because when I first got it, we had to be trained with it. So she is she kept me alive when I was first diagnosed. I was so ill. So she knows more just as much as I know about it and uh, grateful to have her there. And she's aware of everything. 100%. That's great. It's so comfortable knowing that she can handle it if she has to. My husband also has been amazing, but I've also traveled with my daughter and with my best friend. So um, they're both familiar with everything about me and can help me. And I did have one issue on a plane coming back from Australia because that's a very long flight. <laughs> I think I got dehydrated, which is what Dr. Byron was warning me about. I, I felt like I was drinking water, but I don't think I drank enough. And um, in the end, my husband just helped take care of me. And uh, before I got off the plane, he alerted the flight attendants and they got me a wheelchair. And I was wheeled out and through customs flawlessly and, and was feeling better after an hour to lay over and got on the next plane home and, and um, did fine. It, but we just kind of have to know that that can happen, that somebody's there to support us. Um, it might not be different from another person flying. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's a long flight coming back from Australia. Um, Dr. Byram, I'd love to ask you a few questions that have come in from other patients, if that's okay. Some of these you may have covered in your, um, in your presentation already, so forgive me if I hit on some, but you can reiterate maybe for us. Um, one of the questions was about wearing masks and this week's ruling, which you did touch on, but the question specifically came in, should patients continue to wear them when flying? And I, I'd love for you to reiterate that. Yeah, you know, everybody's going to have some sort of personal opinion about this and I'll try not to editorialize too much. I think the the truth is though, that our patients are in the groups that are at highest risk. And for that reason, the safest thing, if you're going to make the decision to travel, I think um, the, the theme of this talk and this webinar is to travel safely. And I think part of that is to do the simple things. It's, it's very easy to wear a mask. Um, and I do think they're effective. Um, the questions come up a lot about what kind of mask to wear. I think um, anything's better than nothing. Um, I think uh, a simple surgical mask like this one, uh, this is what I wear in the clinic every day. Um, I think those are, those are good. You know, the, probably the best thing would be an N95 or a KN95, but they have to fit very tightly uh, to be as effective as they are reported to be. And on a long flight, it might not be as... Um, uh, as feasible. But again, I think this is all about the individual risk assessment. If this is a very, if you're at really, really, really high risk and it's a really important trip and you are traveling, I think in that I've had patients have family emergencies and things like that, where they have to travel. I think it's in those settings where I think you just do the best you can. And that's, that would be a KN95 or an N95 fitting tightly. Um, 
you know, I, I think, again, you have to take it off to drink water and, and eat. And I think that's okay, too. I think you just have, you know, you know, a few minutes here or there without masking will be okay. You're playing a kind of a long term probability game. But I think um, it is, you know, you should feel empowered if you feel at risk to, you know, I don't, you should, shouldn't, um, uh, I guess, cause any ruckuses. But, you know, I mean, if you're next to a stranger on a plane and you feel comfortable telling them, hey, I'm immunosuppressed, if you wouldn't mind putting on a mask, I think that's a very reasonable request. I think, you know, if they decide not to, don't be upset. I think you, you, you again, we're in a, um, we're in a situation where I think everybody's making their own decisions, but, um, I think it's okay. You should feel empowered to, um, let that patient know that you or somebody in your family is immunosuppressed and, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to see how that person reacts. Most people I think would say, yeah, of course. Um, but I, th I would recommend masking in taxis, airplanes, or subways or trains. I think these are high risk spots where COVID will trap, will, you know, switch from one city to another. And I think um, uh, wearing a mask is a simple measure to help mitigate that. Well, that certainly sounds reasonable. Victor, would you be comfortable asking somebody on a plane if you felt like you needed them to put a mask on, if they're really sitting right next to you? Yeah, I, th I think I would because um, when I'm on a plane, I do have a, a regular mask on and a special uh, filter that goes over my trach. So it's pretty obvious to them that I have an issue that they yeah. can see. And uh, I don't, I've never really had any problems with, with folks, you know, honoring requests if necessary. I think that's great that, that Dr. Byron's just empowered us to make, take that step. And I think we all should feel comfortable and just deal with it with a, whatever the results are afterwards. Um, I, another patient question for you, Dr. Byron, would it be wise to pass several COVID tests, which you already told us to do, but what should I do if I tested positive while on vacation? Yeah, there's a couple of different options. Um, one is to notify your provider. If you've got access, either, you know, whatever contact information you have or a patient portal. Um, the second thing, well, in, in that line, I would identify a pharmacy that stocks Paxlovid. This is one of the antivirals that has been pr uh, proven most effective against uh, COVID and it needs to be started within five days or so. And many times, not all pharmacies have it. And so that's something you can do to help uh, expedite the process. If you can notify your provider that I've tested positive and I've identified this particular pharmacy close to me at my destination that you can send a prescription for Paxlovid, I think that will help them a lot. Um, and make it very seamless to get the medicine you need. The other thing is, I think, without, without question, if you are highly symptomatic, uh, short of breath, feeling lightheaded, I mean, uh, nausea, vomiting, and you can't keep up on your liquids, I mean, you just need to get evaluated. So you just need to get into an urgent care center, um, no, notify them, of course, that you have COVID. And I think they'll take it from there, whether it be an antiviral or arrange for you to get um, more intensive therapy with a, with an infusion or, or whatever supportive care you might need. So I really think if you're highly symptomatic, you have to get evaluated. There are limits to what your provider can do on the patient portal. And sometimes you just need to be seen, evaluated, have sets of vitals taken, get IV fluids, get oxygen if you need it, that sort of thing. Gosh, great advice. I actually never thought about checking with the pharmacies first, but I think that's great advice, especially for me, because I'll be on, a, on an island. <laughs> so would need to know that information from my doctor. They wouldn't be able to find that. Um, another question that came is, my family and I are planning a canoeing camping trip. So we'll be far away from medical facilities for at least four days. Any recommendations on my must have medications in case of emergency? Yeah, this is, this is a lot like Victor going to Alaska, remote parts of Alaska. I think um, it kind of depends if if a patient has been in really durable remission for months or years, I, th I think just traveling with your uh, routine maintenance medications is probably a reasonable and, and extras, as I described, is, is a reasonable thing to do. If you think you're at risk of a flare, true flare, it, it's again, but probably better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. But traveling um, with a prednisone dose pack or, or just a bottle of prednisone 
that's another way that your provider can help you at your destination. Um, if, if, uh, and in many patients of mine that travel, I will just send them a bottle, uh, or send them with a bottle of prednisone saying, you know, you're not taking this every day, but if you get into trouble, this is a tool we might use. Prednisone is very cheap and, uh, it's easy to come by. So I think having a, an extra bottle of that, uh, is probably okay. Now don't take it without any kind of provider instruction. Um, but I think just having the tool available would be helpful. I think, uh, Victor brings up an incredibly important point about having, if you have accessory medical information, uh, medical equipment, uh, uh, taking extras and emergency kits for things like tracheostomies. Some patients have urostomies or catheter kits or things like that. So making sure that those that you have extras and plenty of those is, is a very important thing to take with you. Super important points, all of them. How about um, the timing of a rituxan infusion and in travel? Do I need to schedule my trip around this procedure or how, how do I, how do I do that if I'm a patient? Yeah, this is, um, this is a tough question because I think again, if you're undergoing induction therapy, and it's the it's your first round of rituximab. It's patients like that that unless it's a true emergency, um, I, I recommend against travel just to see how you tolerate the medicine. Your your vasculitis was, if not currently active, then very recently active, and these are the high, patients on the highest doses of prednisone, and so the infectious risk is highest. And so in, in those settings, I think um, calling back on the travel is the thing to do. That being said, most patients are because our medicines are very effective now are in a remission of some sort and getting maintenance rituximab every four or six months or sometimes longer. I think um, this is one of those that talking with your doctor is probably the thing to do. They know your case better than anyone and putting your question about travel in the context of uh, the specifics of your disease is the thing to do. Um, you know, cause there are risks to traveling right before rituximab infusion. You're right at the end of a cycle. I mean, m most rituximab infusions put people into a good remission, but perhaps that's the time at which you're most at risk for a flare, but getting it two, three uh, weeks after, or, or traveling two or three weeks after rit uh, rituximab infusion, of course, that you might be at a little bit higher infectious risk, having just gotten the steroids with the uh, rituximab and the, and the rituximab doing its thing. So I think there's risk and benefits to both and really talking with your provider and make, coming up with a decision. As always, it comes back to talk to your own doctor and take their advice because that's your best source of information. Victor, you agree with that? 100% without a doubt. We have um, another slide I'm going to pop in here that just has a few more um, travel tips that I think we hit on most of them, but just in case, we love to put this kind of information up. We got get these travel tips from all kinds of qualified people. Um, the dry, I like this one, the dry air in most hotel rooms wrecks my sinuses and makes me miserable. So I got a small portable humidifier and it fits in my checked bag and it really helps. I love that answer because if you fly a long time on a plane, your sinuses are definitely going to be dried out. And if that's something that's part of your vasculitis, that's a very cool tip. Um, and this one may be, especially if you're traveling out of the country, evac medical insurance can offset the transport to medical facilities or possibly back home. There are lots of different plans you can research on the internet. I also know a friend, not a vasculitis patient who had an uh, incident happen to him when he was out of the country and, and that became a big deal. And he, he said after that, he would always you know, have that op option. And for longer trips, I print off brochures or one page summaries about vasculitis MPA specifically and on info on my medications, which is kind of like what Victor said, if I had to visit a hospital, it's something I can immediately give to attending physicians. And she's right. Sherry says, who probably won't know a lot about my condition. That, that happens. We all know that. And I love this one too. I often wear my Vasculitis Foundation t-shirt when I'm on vacation. It's a great conversation starter. A doctor on my flight to California saw my t-shirt and we had a two hour conversation about vasculitis. What a great way to bring awareness of our disease. I, I've never heard that one. So I'm pretty happy with that one. And some patients need to transport medications or injections that need refrigeration. And there are special travel coolers that you can order to keep them cold. Love all of these great um, tidbits we got from other vasculitis patients. 
Um, thank you so much for all of them for sharing. Uh, Dr. Byram, do you have any final thoughts that you want to share with us? No, I, th I think all of these are are wonderful. I think um, the idea about this the the medivac and additional travel insurance or just or just insurance on a canceled trip, you know, I've, I definitely have had patients come to me asking, "Is this appropriate for me to do?" So again, I think um, it it's tough to be a patient with a chronic disease, and but we you should all feel empowered to bring any even smallish question to your provider. Um, I, I love getting questions I've never been asked before uh, because it makes me think uh, about it more critically. And it also, I, 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 um, a lesson I was taught when I was a young kid was that if you have a question, you should ask it because many times another patient also asks it. So I'm really big on communication between patient and provider. And I think the, the travel is a is a really hot topic nowadays. And I think everybody should really be talking with their docs and asking all the little questions um, and not making assumptions, really trying to get to the bottom of uh, what your risk might be, what specific things your doctor have has to tell you about your situation, and then, uh, you know, opening up an avenue for you to ask any questions that you have. Great, great advice. Um, Victor, I thought I'd give you one more shot. Anything that you want to add or anything that you learned today that you think might be super important that you want to share? I, I, I learned a lot of great tips today. I mean, uh, the hydrate is always an important one. And as, as a GPA patient who has had DVTs in my legs, yes, I not only get up in the airplane and stretch, but I do the, the leg movements where I keep my legs moving to prevent, keep circulation on them. So uh, I just, you know, hope everybody will you know, travel and enjoy and be safe. Great. Thanks. I did want to say also just sharing my little tidbit. I also have had multiple blood clots in my legs and uh, pulmonary. Um, and I wear the compression socks on my trips. And um, I always make sure I have a couple of pair packed. Even when I'm going to a tropical island, I will need them on the way down and on the way back at the very least. And um, I do the leg exercises with my feet, moving them around, doing all the different positions. And it just makes me feel better that I listened to what my doctor said to do so that I don't have that become my emergency on my trip. Uh, I walk around on flights that are over two hours. I just get up and walk back and forth down the aisle. So, um, and some great tidbits here, right here at the end. Don't forget, be prepared for the worst, but expect the best on your vacation. Don't let over preparation take the fun out of the experience. Pace yourself. Don't try to see Rome in a day. Make rest and relaxation your main goal, even if it means always not always doing the things with your companions. I have a great story about that. <laughs> And uh, be where your feet are. This means don't think about what could go wrong, but enjoy where you are at the moment. It's the best medicine. And I did just want to say, I went on a trip to Sweden with uh, three girlfriends and we went out on the outer islands and um, they were hiking the islands and there was a ferry that went from one to the next, but you could also walk from one to the next. And at one point I just said, sorry guys, I'm tired and I know better. So they put me on the ferry and I went over to the next island and stopped at this beautiful little cafe and had dessert and tea and sat there and waited for them. And they got there and they were all sweaty and hot and tired and they had a good time too. And they sat down with me and had, I just found this beautiful little cafe and it was easy for them to come right off the boat, right off the ferry or come right from where they were coming, where I came off the ferry and see me. So there's always cool things you can do like that. So don't, don't overwork yourself. Just enjoy it so much.